The following interview was, was conducted with Carol Eckerd, uh, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, class of 1964 in the Purdue School of Veterinary Medicine for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, um, June the 20th, 2008 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years and education. I was born in Mishawak, Indiana. My mother and father were grocers. They started their own grocery store and all the rest of my family were farmers and I don't know how I was born to that family because I'm the only one that really went into the animal business compared to all the rest. Sure. I was in uh, Catholic uh, grade schools, Catholic uh, high school, and the nuns told me very straightforward that veterinary medicine is an unrelated like profession I should choose something else, maybe like being a nurse or being a nun or being a teacher. And that course did not settle well. And so I, at that time in my life, my father made sure I had animals and had horses. And in fact, I learned a lot of my money to go to college by giving riding lessons. So up there, right, right here in, in South Bend, yes, where I was. Okay, what high school did you go to? St. Joe High School in South Bend. Mm -hmm. All right. And then uh, what was high school like? Uh, any activities that you were in? Well, I was very much interested in my horses during that period of time. And although I was interested in sports, played volleyball and those kinds of things, and was active in student council and all that kind of thing. But I really liked my horses best, and that's what I'd go home to on the weekends. Did and you have some show. horses? Yes, my dad got my first horse when I was 10, so I did have horses. They were stabled right behind the grocery store, which was an oddity, but uh, we that's the only place we had. We didn't have a farm. We had a little house behind our grocery store. That's where the horses were. Well, there kept. was space for them. Right? Space for them, right. Okay. And then tell us, after high school, what was next? Did, where did you go to college? Um, I applied for veterinary school and applied for pre-vet and went right to Purdue. And during my sophomore year, I found out they were not going to accept women in veterinary school. So Dean Schleeman and my father and Dr. Harry McGrain went to visit President Hovde, and we convinced him that women should be allowed to be accepted into veterinary school. And I'll never forget Helen Schleeman looking up to big Dr. Hovde and shaking her finger at him saying, she has a right to go to veterinary school. So that was very, very special. And of course, they opened the school to women then, and four of us were accepted that uh, second year of veterinary school. Okay, that would have been in 1960, because the no. school opened in 59. Right, 60 was the first class, or right. second class accepted, and the class ahead of us were, the average age, I believe, was 35. They were older, they'd come back from the war, and they were all um, about the average age of 32 to 35 years old. So we were the first real young class to go through 18 to 20 some sure. years old. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, on the pre-vet, was that a two year program and then you, from there you got into the vet school? How did that work for researchers? I just Right, at, at that time it was two years of pre-vet and usually people didn't make it in two years. It was usually three or four years, but we were lucky enough to make it in two years at that time, so. Okay. What was the campus like, and did, where did you live on campus? It was growing. We have the motto, you know, when it gets finished, it's going to be beautiful, but this campus is never finished, but it's always beautiful. It was a very, uh, very interesting campus. I lived in X Hall, and uh, Dean Schleeman gave me a key to X Hall because I had to work at the vet school and be there late, so I was one of the few undergraduates that had a key to get in and out of X Hall. I thought that was kind of novel at the time. That's but right. it, was very, it was a very interesting campus. You know, academics were very, very important, but football, basketball were all important also. But when you're in the vet school, you're kind of quarantined off by yourself. So we had our own little uh, social area back sure. there. It was, what were facilities? Were, uh, what, uh, what were the facilities that you had over there? It's different now. But oh yes, share. we had the old veterinary school. We had so the old built that original building that sort of brick and whatever. So well, no, problems. we had a, a the, we had a bigger uh, the the actual vet school was built. Uh, Lynn Hall was built, but oh, not the okay. new school that's there now. Okay. And we we did a lot of our work in the old school, in mm -hmm. the first. In fact, that school was there years before we were as a uh, teaching hospital also, but not for veterinary students. All right, okay. Then yeah. when you graduated, then what was, what was next after graduation? Tell me. Well, I was all enthusiastic because I was just beaming with pride. You know, you're, you're graduated, you're out to do the thing, this is what you've wanted all your life. And so I applied to to three or four different equine practitioners, thinking that I could do what I really wanted to do as being an equine practitioner. The first place I went told me, well, yes, you can work here, but you have to do small animals because they won't limit women in the breeding shed. So I couldn't have done what I really wanted to do, so I decided that wasn't the place for me. The second place I went to was Warrington, West Virginia, which is another veterinarian good friend of mine, and because of personal problems there, 
he couldn't hire me. So I came back home thinking, well, I'll just start my own practice. And at that time, it really wasn't done. But I was so frustrated with not being able to do what I wanted to do that I did start my own practice. I did equine and small animal, and my colleagues around Michigan area were wonderful. They took me with open arms, and I had to earn my way, but they were special, and I started my own practice doing about 80% equine and 20% small animal at oh, that time. Okay, very good. And did you, uh, you had to go out then for the equine to, to the various places, or for the horses? Right. The my dad had a grocery store, and I opened my small animal practice in one little space of his grocery store <laughs> with the front uh, opening to the highway, and then I had a, a station wagon, and that's how I did my equine work. Oh. And we bought a farm, and we had purchased that farm a couple years into vet school. And so I had a place to take the horses if I needed to, if they needed to be hospitalized. Sure. So, What about family? Did you, uh, where'd you meet your husband? And you have, tell us a little about your family. I was married to a man for about a year, had a young son named Larry, and that didn't work out. I was so interested in my practice, to be fair, it was, it was my practice and my son that became the most important sure. thing. So after a couple years, the man I had known for since I was 10 years old and I got together and uh, we ended up getting married and had another daughter, a little girl. And so I have two children, Larry and Chrissy. And Kenny and I have been married about 39 years now. Hey, that's so. great. In uh, your area up there, were there many veterinarians at, at, uh, that when you started your practice? In Michiana, we were lucky enough to have one world veterinarian president, which was Dr. Bill McGrain, Dr. Harry McGrain, Dr. Ray Worley was an AVMA vice president. We had some stellar people. I had very good uh, folks to emulate. I mean, these men were, were, were wonderful to me. They'd open their arms to me and help me, always telling me, nudging me, telling me whatever, but I appreciated their expertise. We had a very good Michiana Veterinary Association. That's good. At that time, ethic was very, very important to all of us, and it was easy to, to practice because you had good colleagues who were very ethical. Good, uh, and good role models for you. Very too. good role models. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's talk then now, let's switch a little bit to the Board of Trustees. You were appointed in 1988 by Governor Orr. Correct. Okay, and how did that come about? Or did uh, Well, a, about some that? of my good, I joined the Purdue Valley Club in South Bend, Mishawak area, and I was very active because I really wanted to give back to my university. You know, I, I really much love Purdue, even though I had a heck of a time getting into vet school and sometimes is not treated like I should have been as a woman, but you know, you get stronger for those things. You don't, you don't get vindictive or vengeful, you get stronger. And so I was very much uh, thrilled with Purdue. Anything Purdue was fine with me. And we raised a lot of money for scholarships there. And two of my friends from that club said, you know, you really ought to be on the Board of Trustees. And I said, well, what do they do? You know, what does the Board of Trustees do? So Bob Lowe, who was the one most active, said, I, I need you to visit with the governor about this. And I said, well, Bob, I first of all need to find out what they do because I'm busy. I've got two kids. I'm working all the time. We were showing horses. We were out active, doing everything in the community. I mean, we're going to Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and swim teams. And my daughter was in dancing and she's showing horses. It's like, I don't know if I can squeak out any more hours to give to anybody. So I did go down to see the governor and Bob Orr had um, given me 15 minutes. 25 minutes later, his secretary is saying, you have a delegation here from Japan, you need to move on. He said, we're having so much fun. Well, I was appointed and uh, then I went to see Dr. Hansen who had just stepped down as president and Dr. Bering had taken his place. And I said, Dr. Hansen, tell me how to be a very good trustee. I want to be the very best trustee I can be. I mean, you have to teach me from bottom up. And he was so gracious and so kind and spent a lot of time. And so then I came to the university and met with Dr. Bering and met with all the folks here and just was enamored with the whole opportunity because I learned so much that I'm sure I didn't give as much as I've learned. And Dr. Hansen did write a book after that about how to be a good trustee. So that was very interesting. That's interesting. Yes. Yeah. Well, now, some of the committees that you're on, uh, one of them is the Academic Affairs Committee. And I, some of these questions I'm keeping in mind for the researchers who are going to benefit mm -hmm. by this. You were the chair, chairwoman of that. Uh, tell us a little bit about what the committee, uh, your involvement at that well, time. Well, Academic Affairs was the promotion of faculty and staff. And at the time I was on that committee, I was very much disappointed that women were not being promoted as they should have been. And of course, that's one of my big things is giving back to women. So I started asking a lot of questions and getting some very vague answers in some areas. And frankly, I'm sure that they thought, me, thought of me as being a really royal pain rather than a productive trustee. However, uh, we changed that from 
from promoting very few women to promoting over 47 to 50 percent when I left the board. And we really tried to work on diversity here. I mean, if you remember, Judy Gappa was one of the first women appointed. Uh, Dr. Fuenza was appointed. We had, it was a start. It was not, you know, we weren't doing monumental things, but for Purdue, it was a lot mm -hmm. because we're very conservative here. And we think about things a long, long, long time before we do things. And so in my world of business, where you have to make decisions every day, every hour, and veterinary medicine, it's a life-saving, do I give this or that? It was kind of sometimes annoying to, to not be able to move along. So we That's did get point. some of those things going, and we did them, we did them very you know, fiduciary sure. responsible right. because right. it was important to do. Yeah. One of the discussions in one of the time you're on was that uh, divestment for the companies that do business in South Africa. And that was a, for the researchers, that was a rather a well ver or conversant topic at that mm -hmm. time. And uh, so, the, but the board reacted on that. And then, well, and we did yeah. a lot of investigation too. You, you've sure. got to realize that when you, Fred Ford and I became very good friends. I, I think Fred was one of the marquee people in this university. He is, right. to me, one of the, the highlights of, of my tenure here is to remember him and to know him. That was an honor for me. And Fred really did a lot of research because, you know, when you buy stocks and you buy and you do investments, Sometimes it takes a long time to find out where these things are actually invested, and that's what happened to us. Nobody meant to do something that was inappropriate, but when we ferreted it out, we did find some of those, and of course, divested. Sure. But that's what it was about. It was not that they purposely invested in something that was inappropriate. It was it was trying to, to buy uh, stocks that were good and investments, mutual funds that were good, and then found out that that they were doing something sure. that we didn't approve of. It is hard to, to track those things because yes. there's so, it's particularly because there's name changes and it, it, you can't do a quick reference thing in order no. to be able to track and, it. And that's it's what happened, working. right. Yeah. I mean, the, the people were very, very responsible that, that do those kinds of things for oh, us. And sure. So it was nothing that was, right. Right. you know, meant to And be. then uh, one of the things was that approval for the alcohol service, the limited alcohol service. That was, that was the time that you were on? Yes. Yeah. I had a problem with, um, the adults of campus being able to have alcohol and the students that were adults not. Uh, that was one of those contentious things that we really had some vigorous discussions, discussions over. On, yes. Right. It was the same time when we voted to have uh, men in the women's dorms. If you remember, that came about then too, and I was very upset with that. I never did approve of that. For instance, young women come to campus at 17, 18 years old, and they have to have something to be able to, to crawl back into that's their safety area. And I reminded the men in ca on that board that their daughters were coming here, and they better really think this through before they allow that to happen. <laughs> so that was a very interesting couple of weeks. It was, right. Were there any other committees that you served on when you were there? You yes, I served on the facility committee. Oh, good. Talk and that's that. when we built the big uh, practice barn out here, the great big practice arena for football. Right. And we had some some vigor invigorating the one discussions. The Mullenkos Athletic Center. It's the, yes, mm -hmm. yes. We had some interesting discussions about that and why ours cost more than others and. And of course we do, when we build something on campus, it is built to last a lifetime. And that's that's good. And we talked about the diverse uh, business of being able to have different contractors bid and different architects bid. And there's something to hiring the same people back because they know Purdue's uh, what they what we need what we want and there was some good discussions about that I think it's much more open now right it's a, and it's a learning thing for the people that yes been it is closer to it then some of the things that uh, one was that uh, there was construction and renovation like the bearing building was built in 93 and then talk about the budget and tuition some of the other activities that the board is involved in well the hardest thing in the world is to raise tuition and I keep reminding myself as well as the board, this is a land grant university. And we have an obligation to the people of Indiana. To me, that's so very important. And it was always important to me. I spent a lot of time with students. I stayed in the dorms. I stayed in the uh, co-ops with them. When you I don't down. think any other trustee had ever done that before. And Dr. Beering sometime rolled his eyes at me like, do you really have to do that? I, yeah, I really have to do that. You wanted, I wanted to know what the students were like. Sure. You know, you knew what the students were like when you had the president of the student body and those folks, which are always high achievers, but I was interested in the C student, the B student, the kids were having a tough time, right. and got to know some of those folks, and, and we, we started, um, I think it's boiler, what is it, boiler, 
Well, now it's Boiler Gold Rush, but uh, the uh, Gold Rush before the student when students, students come, come right, because they need else. a better orientation to our campus. The biggest complaint I hear is it's so big, and it scares some of these kids from rural Indiana. So the students were very, very important to me. So raising tuition was very tough. But on the other hand, we have to keep good faculty. We have to keep good staff. So my answer is we raise more money for scholarship. We keep raising money and raising money. And that was not something Purdue did in those areas. We didn't advertise much, and we weren't allowed to raise money in that fashion. So when Martin Jeske came on the scene, I was very pleased to be on that steering committee to raise the $1,500,000,000. Or yeah, I was going to talk about giving back, yeah. That's a, which you have alluded to on several yeah. occasions, and it's it's really changed a lot over time. Yeah. Right? It has, and uh, it's very very much needed. Um, the other, then the the other thing that uh, one of the other things the board is is the fees for the athletics and the special fees, and that that's a hard thing to do. To it to is decide. hard, and and for the residence halls is another fee. It's very the, difficult because you're 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 charging for what the students get. I mean. We have a first-class university here, and we have a lot of things other people don't. So somebody has to pay for that. Somewhere along the line, we had to pay for it. And I still think that we've, we've done a phenomenal job by raising this big hunk of money to give back to those areas because right. it's important. And on the outside of Purdue University, I spend a lot of my time raising money for scholarships through the Indiana Veteran Medical Association, Indiana Animal Health Foundation, and the Purdue Club of St. Joe Valley, we all raise money for scholarships here. The Purdue Valley Club I belong to has raised more money for scholarships than any other Purdue club in the country, 20 plus thousand dollars a year. When you raise them, do you limit it only to the people in that area, or is it open to anybody? How it share uh, might share. Most that. of it for St. Joe County is okay. St. Joe County students. The Indiana Veterinary Medical Association is anybody in Indiana, and then the Indiana Animal Health Foundation is anybody in Indiana. Okay. So okay. we do raise a lot of money, and that's giving back. I think really important. Oh, yes. And the other big issue is the Title IX issue with the students. They were afraid that because I was so involved with with women's sports that. I was going to take away from the men's sports, which was not the case. I mean, I love football and basketball, so it's better to start another group like softball or baseball for women mm -hmm. than it was to take away from the men's sports. So that was another thing we tried very hard to work mm -hmm. on. Well, tell us about what other to your involvement in the sports. What, how was that? What sort of involvement did you have? Well, Kenny and I have given a scholarship for women's basketball, and I got to go with women's team a couple times and fly with them when I was on the on the board, which was very much fun because those girls are awesome. And, you know, they give so much sports. The kids who give, well, I shouldn't say kids, they're young men and women, who actually spend their time working with the athletic departments and doing the things they do, plus getting good grades, is amazing to me. These kids are phenomenal. And then you talk about the uh, ancillary groups like the cheerleaders and the glee club. Those kids get no scholarship, or they don't get any kind of grades for that or any kind of credit, and yet they're working their hearts out too. I tried to, to do something for that, but it just never came through where they would get some kind of credit or something because those kids spend a lot of time giving back to Purdue. And what wonderful ambassadors. The Glee Club and the Purdueettes are phenomenal kids. They're just okay. great. Very good and bad. Yes. Did you ever go to any of the bowls? Everyone. Everyone. Oh. I didn't go to the one when I first graduated because I couldn't afford it. I, I, there's no way. Did you, I, did you, get, you must have gone to both of the Rose Bowls then, did you? Not the first one. Oh, okay. No, not the first one. Went to the second one. Okay. Yeah. That, that yeah Kenny and I had been to every bowl game. We just enjoyed it tremendously and had a part in hiring Joe Tiller, so it was very important <laughs> that we supported Joe because Joe and Arnett are wonderful people. Yeah, very nice. Um, you also do, the board is involved in um, approval of appointments. How about the Purdue Health Plan? You sort of get that comes before the board too. The health plan. The health plan came before the board. Uh, we had a committee that that actually worked with that. Uh -huh. We were trying very hard to give everybody a satisfactory health benefit because it, it's so important, and, and we wanted to have it past the time that they worked here too. We have a very good um, a retirement plan here with Crofts, and I think that's been wonderful. But we wanted to make sure that the faculty and staff who give so much to the university were cared for. And we worked hard on that. That was a very special, it it's was a special to, committee that, that reported back to the rest of the board. But sure. That's hard because the costs keep you know, oh. yeah. going up and things of that sort. 
Um, then the you had a the student trustee was on the board. We yes, that's right. And I got, got to work with many of them. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's very good. How about the statewide technology program? That was in going when you were on the board. <sighs> that's one of my favorites. I I really truly care about that has grown a lot. Yes, but it hasn't grown fast enough in my area. Hmm. South Bend. I've been on that advisory board for a long time, trying to. I've I've been part of the uh, group that chose the the director there. But it hasn't grown fast enough. In South Bend, Ivy Tech has grown by leaps and bounds. IUSB has grown by leaps and bounds. And we kind of just stay stagnant. And we've got to have a better face of what we do up there. And I think we have a, a niche to fill, but it has to be from central campus on. Somebody down here has to be able to say, OK, let's put some time and effort and money behind this. And it's not happening in South Bend for some reason. Yeah. I'm going to work, work on that. How about the residence halls? And, uh uh, fees and things that are coming to plan, and, and that's another thing that comes before the board too. Yes, uh, and that's very important because we we saw a difference, a shift in in uh, demographics of who actually stayed in the dorms and those kinds of things. And I see we just built two more dorms. Uh, the students can live cheaper in a dormitory setting eating in campus settings and they can't off campus. However, you've got this, I want to be free and I want to be able to do as I please and that type of thing. So we saw a shift and I think it's coming back to reality now where it's much less expensive to live on campus. It's closer, you don't have to drive your car. I think it's coming back to where it was when I was a student, yeah. where you just walked everywhere. And then there's been a lot of building in the community too, a lot of yeah. apartments and I don't think they're not probably all rented either. Well, and then right. there's the new, you know, kids living together that they didn't do in those days and so it's it's a different type of, of group of grouping of people sure, there's right. a safety issue and and that type of thing but campus here has been awfully safe we've been very fortunate right exactly yeah um, president's council you've been involved with that and active on that yes yeah. president's council I it, it's I think I'm not sure what Carol and Gary would tell us but the first numbers were so small and I think it's now over 17 or 1800 I believe it's just phenomenal and what a grand group of people to work with I mean it, it, I've seen it grow and support the university and that's our core support so that's very very important met some great great people right phenomenal. And some good uh, good trips too as well yes yeah. the trips have been good and we go to Naples every year and go to the president's council there and come to the president's council weekend here and the back to class has been awesome people really enjoy that yeah. friends will tell me do you know we do this at Purdue and because they really don't Purdue's so big and has so much to offer for the world that we really don't in our own area sometimes realize all that all of the I've been very uh, receptive to helping the cancer center too, putting on several dinners with Dr. Lau and Dr. Leary and those kinds of folks because, you know, we have famous, fantastic people here. Right. And, and people in our own state don't even know these people. And that cancer center is, is unique in the sense because uh, I know when it got started, it's been here for a long, yeah. you know, long time. Now I think it's more visible, but mm -hmm. it's, and it's unique to have that type of center, you know, right. when it was established here on campus. Right. So that it's grown. And let's talk a little bit about giving back uh, and fundraising, how that's changed over time. Um, well, like I told you in the beginning, uh, yeah. it was not Dr. Beering's thing to really fundraise. That was not something Steve really wanted to do. That was not his forte. Uh, but when the board got together and started writing the criteria for the new president, I just got the tip end of that. When they hired Dr. Jeske, he was a fundraiser, and he has done a monumental job for us, and we need that. But that billion, $700 million is, is phenomenal for staff, for students, for building, for everything we have here. You've got to have a first class university to compete anymore in the world and there's no excuse why we can't. Uh, we bring in a lot of money here, we have great people here and I think the thing about family is important. We have grown our own and that's important. I mean we have outside blood coming once in a while but there's still people here that are so special that, that you know, we talk about Dr. Brown, we talk about Dr. Geddes, we talk about these phenomenal people who are world renowned. We're fortunate here, very right, fortunate. Right, right, exactly. Diversity, uh, that uh, and the strategic plan. Now, the, you were not on when the, Dr. Jeske's strategic plan no. had gone on, but diversity was something that you addressed earlier, and that that's that's been you know uh, taken. From, well, uh, it's you know we're very conservative, and it takes a long time for us to to come through this. Mm -hmm. And I think the big issue with me was women not being 
promoted. We have, in fact, I, I, I will tell you now, it's, a lot of the women are not here anymore, but when I first became a trustee, I was very fortunate to be welcomed into this little nest of women who helped me ask questions. I said, you, I, I cannot possibly learn everything I've got to learn to be a good trustee if I don't have help. So I was fed some very good facts and figures and, and helped and mentored and, and just talked to about issues because I thought I knew Purdue, but I didn't know Purdue until I became a trustee. Uh, but the Betty Nelsons of this world, the Helen Schleemans of this world, the Bev, you know, Dr. Stone, all these folks were so wonderful to me and many, many others that sat down and said, you know, here's our problem, here's what we need. And then I could help. And it was, it was wonderful to be able to open to doors. Able, and, and that to, conversation, right. just have a conversation. Or just have a conversation, right. a very honest, open conversation. And they were wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. That's good. Um, you received the Distinguished Alumnus Award from the School of Veterinary Medicine, which is nice. You've been active in the alumni. And tell us a little about your activity with the uh, State Association, too. Well, when I um, was in veterinary school, I started the Veterinary Alumni Association, which was something brand new because Purdue hadn't had its special little alumni association, but we were different. You know, we were such a close-knit family at Purdue at the veterinary school. I mean, we're, we're one-tenth the size of the engineering school, so it, w it was pr appropriate for us. So when I started that group, then when you graduated, I went right into organized veterinary medicine. I wanted to to help make way for women and not necessarily just carry a banner but to prove it by being the best, best veterinarian I could be. And so I became active with committees but you know everybody ahead of me was the men and so sooner or later 125 years into IVMA I became the first woman veterinary president and uh, it was a very special honor to do that because there just hadn't been any before that and it was not easy because some of the folks uh, I don't know whether they're afraid of you or resent you. I've never figured that quite out, but you know, they 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 just don't they don't feel comfortable with you in their space. <laughs> so so it was a very interesting time, yeah. and was very much working with animal welfare on the same note, which is not something that's been popular at that time. Now it is. I mean, if you're in animal welfare and animal care, why? You know, it's the thing to do. But in those days, they were very suspicious of a woman who was a tree hugger or a bunny hugger. They just didn't think that was appropriate. But Veterinarians, by nature, are animal caretakers. Right. I mean, we are the people who speak for the animals. So as time went on, those things softened, and things moved on, and, and life was much better. Right. And I started a group called Indiana Animal Health Foundation, which is the fundraising arm for the Indiana Veterinary Medical Association. And we fundraise for disasters, for help with indigent animals, for leadership projects, those kinds of things. Are they done, uh, for at the local level? Uh, the state level. State level, mm -hmm. I see. And state so you level. can re request funds and, and try to, right. from mm -hmm. that standpoint. Um, the classes in the vet school have increased over time. Your class was probably a lot smaller. My class was, I think, 61 when we okay. started, and I think it was 40 or 50-something when we graduated. I have to go back and check, but right. now there's 70. Yeah. And really, it's probably going to be bigger because there's going to be a veterinary shortage pretty soon. And Big and time. It's, it's hard. You know. It's hard, but then when you really teach people the way they have to be taught and the amount of information that has to go into those heads before they graduate is um, unbelievable. Yeah. And we don't have the room at vet school. We, we've got a very good vet school, but the space is not is not applicable for these young people to be added to in a classroom. You can't squeeze 10 more people in. Yeah. It just doesn't work. Yeah. So that's, that's a problem. Facility is always a challenge. Yes. Um, Let's a couple other awards that you got. The Outstanding Woman Veterinarian Award in 19, from the American Association of Women Veterinarians. That's very nice. That's very special. Yeah, that's, they all, and our dean, all awards are. Our know? dean was with me at the time. Dean Lewis was, okay. and his wife, Meyer, were down there in Orlando when I got that award. It was very special yeah. to have my vet school there. Do you sometimes get surprised when you get the awards, or how does that come about? I sometimes <laughs> ask the question. Sometimes people say, well, not really, or yes, it was. It depends. Yes, because... Um, I've always uh, appreciated the people who went before me. I mean, I always thought they were phenomenal. And then when you get something like that, it's, whoa, you know, why did they pick me? You know, and, and you don't, I've never been someone to think about the things I do. It's, to me, it's just a momentum that I do them. And so when someone says thank you, it's like, whoa, that's gasoline to get me going for another 10 years. So, <laughs> right. yes, uh, they're, they're very, very special awards that yeah. I've gotten. And uh, a couple other things. How about a favorite Purdue tradition? You got anything like that that you'd like to share with us? 
Or well, football? I love sports weekends. I love football weekends. I mean, I really, Kenny and I come down. We come down on Friday night in our motorhome with our dogs, parked by the golf course. And, of course, we're here for the weekend. We love it. Uh, President's Council weekend is good. Gala week is good. Purdue homecoming is special. The vet school has our own... Um, uh, week we come back for continuing education. We have all kinds of activities then. I've never missed one. So those are the special ones. Okay. You know, we come back for a lot of things. Um, the um, annual meeting of the, of the association for many years has always been a pretty, and that's like a continuing education sort of thing, which right. is really, mm -hmm. really good. We have our dean's luncheon, which the right. dean's club has. Then we have our awards night, which all the classes come back and talk about what they've done, which I think is very special yeah. to see people who have come across it. We're having our 50th anniversary next year for vet school, so that'll be very special. That's so right. Now tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. You're not, you're changing, a little bit change of, of hats in uh, Yes, I've sold my practice, and um, I still practice some equine medicine, but I, at my veterinary, or my shelter, my Humane Society, almost 80 hours a week. I am the director now. I volunteer that position because we can't afford to really hire anybody at this point. I do all their spay neuters, and it's just my advocation in life. I love it. To be able to give those animals a home and find people to adopt and really have a first-class shelter, we're getting ready to build. We've got possibly enough money to do that so that'll be the icing on the cake when I can get the animals out of our 60 year old facility and put them in a beautiful facility where they can have a home and until they're adopted sure. it'll be right. special. Do you, uh, are, do you, are you very fortunate in being able to get them adopted as it seem to be? I have a huge adoption rate now we've worked on that it's been we're adopting over 100 animals a month which is very good. Uh, we Our euthanasia rates are very, very low there, but I've been accused of having too many animals. But, you know, we try very hard to adopt everything, any which way possible to give them a chance. Right. And we've changed our ideas about adoption a lot. We're trying to get cats out to farms where they can live a good life. I mean, it's better than death. And so I have a lot of help with my Michiana Veterinary Association, wonderful volunteers, a great board of directors. So we're really working hard at it. Good. And we, we're making some great strides. We collect, we really fundraise well. We're, we're making the, the shelter kind of an icon for the area because it is important for people, for the community to volunteer right. and help. You know, it's the community that causes the problem. It's their cats that multiply and multiply and multiply. Right. So it's the community that has to come to the rescue too. That's so. right, exactly. Uh, how about uh, do you have an uh, outstanding event in your life? Something come to mind? Yes, the birth of my two children. Good. Marriage to my husband. And, oh, graduating from vet school was very important. <laughs> and then getting my honorary degree, that was very special, yeah. too, because my whole family was there. Yeah. My father was still alive, so it was great. How did you, and how did you find out about that? Well, I was told because I had to prepare a speech. And uh, I was given about, I don't know, a week's notice, I think, something like that. I, I I didn't really know. I mean, they really surprised me, but I had a week to, to prepare this, and I thought, oh, boy, you know, in front of everybody that you've ever known practically. It, it was very, very special. Yeah, that very is, special. that's right. Yeah. Any uh, closing comments or, uh, that you'd like to share for the researchers that you'd like to say? Well, I just think that if, if one lesson's learned is to give back because... Uh, I, I talk to people every day who tell me, well, you know, I got through Purdue, but I paid. Well, you get more out of this university than you ever give. And to be able to pay it forward and pay it to these kids, these youngsters, I, go, I come back and speak every year for an ethics course at the vet school. And I sit there and look at these young eyes, just all these sponges, just taking all this in. And you tell them about some of the things that happened, and they look at you like, you had to wear hose in, in class, you had to wear skirts, Yes, we had to look like veterinarians. No cut off shorts, no rolled up shirts. We had to look like professionals. And in those kinds of things, I, I, I think I'd like some of that back. I think that teaching, teaching ethics is so important in life. Mm -hmm. You know, ethics to me is, is how you live. If you're not a religious person, that's one thing, but you have to be ethical. Because even if you're ethical to your patient or ethical to the client or to your family, you have to be. And I don't see a lot of that. I see some young people struggling with those with those issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe maybe it's there, but it's it's slightly under the under the top of their right. skin. It's so not it needs really to be brought up. And this is and by yes. you sharing that information, I think it brings it to the fore, and they yes. realize the value. And, the and I think that being kind, you know, um, there's so much anger in the world, and so much destruction, and so much hate, and so much that the world is a better place than that. I mean. 
we live in a beautiful part of the country. We live on a farm and you know, we look out every night, deer crossing the pasture, squirrels, all this stuff. That's really peace and it's fun. So right. it's there's, good. there's good things and yeah. I think that people need to reflect on the good right. things and look and at positivity. You have to bring it back to reality sometimes. Well, and positive, you have to be positive. Right. You, you, you can't dwell on what's bad. You have to dwell on what's good and push it forward because if you don't, you'll succumb to that. Right, exactly. Thank you very much, Dr. Eric. I really appreciate that. My pleasure. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome.